Hello and what's up? And may the 5th be with you, because it's May the 5th, uh, 2022, and you are watching the Edge Play weekly live show. I'm your host this week, my name is Adam Burt, and it's my pleasure to be your guide to the wonderful world of games this week. Uh, I am joined for the news today by one Ben Joy, and I've noticed straight away that I've tagged you as if you're tired. Let's uh, turn that off. Wow. Boom. Now you've got no name whatsoever. Um, but Ben's here to chat about all the latest industry news from the world of games. We're going to be getting into that in just a second. We've got two big news stories to talk through this week. Um, after that, uh, we'll be playing some Cyberpunk 2077, basically seeing, did they fix it? And is it any good? Um, so stick around for that if you like shooting, cybering, or punking. Um, hello in the chat to Miles, thanks for tuning in. And later on in the show, Tyre will be here, which is why her name was on the slide briefly. Um, because she's going to be here talking about game demos. We're talking about what makes a good game demo, what are the best game demos, uh, and how should you approach creating a demo if you decide to do one, um, how should you handle it, how should you promote it, all those sorts of things. So lots of great info coming up. Um, are you ready to get started with the news, fake Tyre? Yes. Cool. Well, we're starting this week with a merger and acquisition story, a little bit of M&A, as we like to call it. Um, it's quite an interesting one. So the Embracer Group is basically set to acquire three big studios, Crystal Dynamics, Eidos Montreal, and Square Enix Montreal. The deal is expected to close between July and September this year, pending approval from regulators, uh, but it's reportedly worth 300 million US dollars, which only sounds like a lot until you remember how much video game companies and IP actually cost. This is an insanely good deal. <laughs> it's genuinely astonishingly cheap. It's an absolute bargain compared to recent deals, such as Sony's acquisition of Bungie for 3.6 billion, with a B, US dollars. Um, as part of the deal, Embracer's purchasing the Tomb Raider, Deus Ex, Thief, Legacy of Kane franchises, as well as more than 50 back catalogue titles. Um, and according to Embracer's announcement, they like to uh, promote this and flout it a bit. 88 million Tomb Raider games have been sold to date, as well as 12 million Deus Ex titles over the last many, however many years. Uh, and we already know, for example, that Crystal Dynamics is working on a brand new Tomb Raider, Power by Unreal Engine 5. It's also supposedly supporting development on Microsoft's Perfect Dark reboot. Uh, the low price point is thought to be due to the recent track record of Square Enix's titles created by these studios. Uh, they're obviously a very successful publishing house, but they've been more popular and successful in Japan, and their Western titles haven't necessarily sold as well. Uh, they struggled to gain traction in recent years with uh, Avengers, which was Crystal Dynamics, and the recent Guardians of the Galaxy game, which we played last week on the show, was developed by Eidos Montreal, and that undershot initial expectations, according to one report. Uh, and to be clear, generally these speaking, uh, generally speaking, these studios are well regarded. They are studios that, in the industry, we think of as making good games. But there has always, I guess, been a feeling that maybe Square Enix isn't getting the best out of them, or things just aren't quite gelling with those two companies. So. Hopefully their new home for all three of them uh, as part of the Embracer Group will see them launch some great stuff in the years to come. Ben, what do you make of this story? Yeah, um, I think the interesting thing is, like you said, is the, is the price point. It's uh, very cheap. Um, like you say, it feels like a big, big bargain. Just, I mean, just for the Tomb Raider franchise alone, um, as well as the other ones that you mentioned. But, I mean, Tomb Raider is it's huge. Like 88 million copies of the game. Obviously, the films come out. You know, it'll be I'm sure it'll be one that's due for another reboot in films soon. So that will generate more interest for the IP. And yeah, I've been saying it a lot, and I've been saying it a lot recently. Is just the value of IP is so high um, that it feels like this IP has been massively undervalued. So it feels like the Embracer Group have probably got um, got themselves a a deal. Hopefully the. <laughs> Hopefully they're not going to read it in uh, Bloomberg and the sellers will be like, no, we, we, we missed a zero. We've got to put, we put the decimal point in the wrong place. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, yeah, 300 million is, it seems blase to say it's not an awful lot of money um, for, for the industry. So, And it'd be exciting to see what they do with it as well. Uh, like I say we know there's a Tomb Raider game in the works. Um, it's been a long time since I've played a Tomb Raider game, probably since, like, everything was at an angle um like ps2 days um or maybe even ps1 days but uh yeah i mean 
it's a trend that's not going to slow down the acquisitions and mergers feels like it's been a lot more acquisitions than mergers uh recently um and yeah i don't think it's going to uh i don't think it's going to change i think it's just the way the industry is going if you're successful you're going to get snapped up by someone bigger probably which is is good for you um or if you're maybe not being as successful as you once were you'll get bought on a bargain so yeah and to give the folks at home some context about this deal so this deal is worth 300 million us dollars by comparison uh rare was bought by microsoft over a decade ago um for 375 us dollars in million um and I mean, inflation alone should dictate that this number should be way bigger than that. Um, yeah. But the fact that it's three studios rather than one is is, mm. is genuinely astonishing. Um, how the the kind of price point they've arrived at here. I don't know what maths they've done at Square Enix. Maybe they just figured it's not working. <laughs> Have them. Um, but it's uh, definitely a surprising turn of events. Um, and good luck, of course, to everyone at those studios. Hopefully, everything goes well in the acquisition, and you all get to keep your jobs. <laughs> Uh, next up in our news, then, we're talking about Overwatch 2, and the beta, or beta, if you're an American, uh, has arrived uh, to mixed reviews. Um, so there's some some good stories here, or some good news, rather, I should say, for, for Blizzard, um, because there was a lot of Twitch viewership. So some players were able to snag an early spot in the beta, um, but those who were left behind could earn spots in the beta by watching popular Twitch streamers playing the game. Uh, basically, it's Twitch drops. You know, we've talked about Twitch drops on the show before. You tune in and you get access to things in return. You're able to gain access to the Overwatch 2 beta or beta um, by doing that. As a result of that surrounding hype and players, you know, desperate to get in and to check out this game, uh, they actually broke viewership records across Twitch with the 1 million concurrent viewers tuning in to try and get those codes. Uh, sadly, it's not all good news though. So, reviews from journalists and from some of those streamers haven't been that kind they've been pretty harsh you might even say uh, and twitch viewership has dropped by 99 percent since those initial heights um, so to give you some context on, on what's happening here as part of the move to overwatch 2 from overwatch 1 character abilities have been reworked and it's going down from 6v6 to 5v5 and many people are apparently feeling like the changes don't really add much and actually detract from the kind of core overwatch experience um, so a bit of a bit of a rocky launch maybe for Overwatch 2 on the horizon here, but uh, it is only a beta, so they could decide to change a lot of things before launch. What do you make of this, Ben? I mean, good news for Twitch. Like, proves that Twitch drops still works. I think that's pretty much the only positive uh, out of it, really. Um, yeah, it's a shame that people don't like it. It's always a, always a difficult one when you come with a with a sequel especially i think for a game like overwatch which doesn't feel like it's poised for you know for necessarily a, a sequel um but yeah it's disappointing that people that like it but as you said it's a it's a beta so there's plenty of time to fix it and it'll be interesting to see whether that's um like whether the, the criticism is taken on board it'll be interesting to see whether if it's not taken on board do people vote with their feet my guess would be they probably won't. People will probably just buy it anyway um, and not enjoy it. But uh, yeah, I mean, looking more at Twitch drops, it's it's great that that works. I mean, Valorant had insane success doing exa basically exactly the same thing. Um, so it's it's the positive for anyone thinking about doing Twitch drops. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's very lackluster from from Overwatch because there's always a lot of hype around that. It's a dedicated fan base. They always do cool things like Overwatch outside of the game, like I really liked when they did Overwatch shorts and, and stuff like that. So for them to not then deliver on the game to have people like is it's disappointing, but it's it's recoverable. All, all rocky launches are recoverable, um, as we may or may not learn in the next segment of the show. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just a bit of a, just, it just feels a bit flat, really. Um, would you agree? It's just a bit of a flat one, really. Yeah, and I actually, I was an Overwatch fan, haven't played in a long time, and there's nothing about this that's enticing me to go back to it. I think that's probably how a lot of people will feel looking at it. I think maybe everyone's moved on, and there's not enough here to 
to entice you back to make you really invest in the franchise again, which is a shame. But it is a beta, and uh, it's actually thematically linked with both of our future segments because we're going to look at Cyberpunk in just a second, but also later in the show we're talking about demos, and a beta is kind of a demo. It's like a multiplayer demo. Um, That's how we thread these shows together. Exactly, it's almost like we planned it. Expertly produced. I asked Blizzard, can you launch the, the Overwatch 2 beta just the week of this show, just so I could talk about it? And they said, who are you? Um, oh, yes. That's the end of our news for this week. But if you like news, if you like reading about or hearing about things that are happening in the games industry, make sure you check out our roundup. It's every week on the Etch Play blog. You can find it at etchuk.com forward slash play. Um, there'll be one tomorrow. It's every Friday. So you'll get opinions and views from me and from Ben and from other people that we work with here at Etch Play as well. All sorts of interesting stories, hopefully, in tomorrow's edition. So make sure you check that out. Um, We are going to switch over to a little gameplay segment, and this is some Cyberpunk 2077 gameplay that me and Ben actually captured together uh, and talked over, so you get a little bit of both of us. And we'll be back in about five minutes with Tyre to talk about game demos, so don't go anywhere. Bye. Bye. Woods out the NCPD is going to put Watson on lockdown. If I'm going to sleep in my own bed tonight, we better put it in fifth. Hello, it's me, Adam, and I'm joined by Ben Joy, and uh, ask me anything about Cyberpunk, or at least the beginning of Cyberpunk, which is what we're looking at here, um, being played on Xbox Series X, um, with like all the latest updates and stuff, so it should work a little bit better, hopefully. How's it going, Ben? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Not too bad, yourself? I'm good. Uh, what's your first question about Cyberpunk? <laughs> um, what makes this cyber a punk? I was going to ask you what makes this punk cyber, but that's too obvious. I want to know what makes this cyber a punk. I think punk is about being like antagonistic towards the systems that control us, you know. Mm-hmm. And cyber is a way of doing that with robots and stuff. Can't uh, stop night city. So this is, yeah, I mean, a really high-profile release from from last year that maybe didn't have the smoothest launch, and they were like. <laughs> Don't worry, guys. We're going to fix it. Yeah, see you in 12 months. Yeah. And they have now fixed, they fixed it to their credit. From like a performance point of view, I think people do still have a lot of complaints about maybe the gap between what they wanted it to be, maybe what it was advertised as, and what it actually is um, yeah. in terms of like moment-to-moment playing it. So definitely from a performance, performance point of view, it seems a lot more stable, um, and it's very... Nice to look at visually. Oh, this is a bit of a nighttime scene, so you get kind of like a, a rain effect and some neon. It also looks good during the day. Um, and then sometimes dudes try and shoot you. Fucking drive, Jackie. Oh yeah, uh, language warning. Oh yeah. <laughs> Kids, turn off now. Yep. I mean that's the real punk aesthetic. Is saying swear words on YouTube. Nothing says punk like dropping a few F. <laughs> which we which we won't do. We would never do. Got you, so yeah, this is near the beginning of the game, so you have to worry about spoilers if that's your bag. But if you want to see it at all, you can play it. Because it is stable enough to do so. Let's do a little bit of uh, combat here. So I, I just killed I, this we, guy. Yeah, nice. Put him in a freezer. Yep. So we, we've spoken a lot over the last 12 months about this game and its rocky release and everything's going on, on with it. And I just, I wonder how much long-term damage to this title it will have done. I think CD Projekt Red will be fine. Like, I think their next game will be fine. I think people will be hesitant, but I don't think it's going to harm them long-term. Whereas with this game, I wonder whether it's going to have had a knock-on effect where, like, had it gone smoothly, this could have been maybe a GTA... 5-esque in that people just play this for donkey's years and I wonder now because it took so long to get it to where it needed to be whether it will still end up being like that um, I guess time will tell but it's definitely it's interesting to see whether it will have that long term effect on will this become a kind of game to the service game like a long life game or is it going to be kind of been like a, a one and done for players because they were almost over it before it got good yeah and i think one one thing that i think a lot of players 
Uh, I, mean, I think it's a good game. Let's let's make, be clear about that. I think this game yeah. is actually a good video game. But I think for a lot of people, they were hoping that it was going to be maybe deeper than it is. Like it, mm. it's it's maybe quite a superficial game. Like the the systems at play here aren't maybe as complex as um, as some other titles that. You know, even their own titles, even you know, as complex as like the The Witcher Three, for example. Um, I think this is a little bit more straightforward. So that might have. There'll be some people who will just never forgive it for that. Like they'll never forgive the game for what it is compared to what they wanted it to be, and yep. arguably could have been. Um, but I think that it will have its fans, and it wouldn't surprise me if we do see a Cyberpunk twenty seventy eight uh, or like a, a sequel to this or a spin off or something because. They obviously put a lot of effort into it, um, but I do think that you know they've already announced The Witcher Four. I'm sure that is in part due to the maybe slightly tepid response um, to Cyberpunk's launch. That they're like, let's just <laughs> we fixed it, let's move on and get people excited about the next one because this this hasn't ignited in the way that we had maybe hoped that it was going to. And we are back. You're watching the Xplay weekly live show with me, Adam Burt, and I'm joined for the next segment by the one and only Tyre. How's it going, Tyre? It is going well. I had the stream on in my other ear and I got very confused by hearing you twice, but I'm all, all better now. <laughs> <laughs> um, How are that, you, Adam? I'm good. That was a clip from Cyberpunk 2077. If you liked that clip, you'll be able to see even more Cyberpunk footage over on our YouTube channel after today's show. Uh, it goes live about 4.30, I think. So there's, like, fifth, I think, a 15-minute video of game, Cyberpunk gameplay. So you can check that whole thing out after we're done here. Um, we're going to chat now about game demos, though. And mm -hmm. last week, we reported that Sony is going to require devs to offer game trials to PlayStation Plus premium subscribers with a minimum of two hours playtime. It's got a lot of people talking about game trials which allow consumers to experience the full game for a limited period of time. And it's got people thinking about game demos too, which are often similar to game trials, but maybe limited in other ways rather than time boxed, or may even be bespoke experiences that showcase the game's features without being the full game. So we thought we'd have a chat about that and talk about what makes a good demo. Um, and there was nobody better in the universe for me to talk to about this entire <laughs> So I quickly snapped her up and got her on the show. Um, Tyre, what does make a good demo? <laughs> oh, the million dollar question. Um, well, I'm very honored to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, demos are an interesting one because like you say, there's lots of different ways that people refer to them. Um, and I think there isn't really a clear cut understanding in the game industry of the difference between a demo, a trial, a early version, a prototype. Sometimes those things are um, equal, sometimes they're not. Um, and there's lots of different ways that you can do a demo. So I think that's a conversation we were having around. Um, there's demos out there that are uh, just a bit of the game, but they are gated in some ways. So for example, it might uh, stop you from advancing beyond a certain area or it'll have a time limit on it. So you can play the game for five hours and see how far you get in those five hours, but that's it. Um, and that's, quite often used, I think, by uh, bigger games. So AAA games will often um, do that. I remember when uh, Mass Effect Andromeda came out, that takes me back, uh, and uh, it was an interesting uh, game in terms of its reception, but I liked it. Um, they actually had a demo available before the game came out on Origin, if you were an Origin subscriber that let you play the game up to a certain point or um, for, I think, 10 hours. Um, and that was kind of like a mixed thing. So that's something that uh, games do quite well. Um, but I've only really seen it to that, like in, in the bigger games, maybe the double A's, not so much in the indies. Uh, but it's a great way to kind of show what the game is, show some of the main mechanics, get people excited about the world um, and then be like, that's it, that's all you get. If you want to get more, you have to uh, you have to pay. So uh, Yeah, and I guess that's kind of what Sony are encouraging here by offering game trials, which are going to be time limited, 
almost definitely will be the beginning of the game. It's possible for it not to be, I guess. They could say, here's half an hour from the end. But uh, you could uh, <laughs> probably... Uh, 99% of them will be the beginning. I think it puts a lot of focus on the beginning of your game. And actually, maybe it's focus that should be there anyway. Because whether you've got a demo or not, or a game trial or not, the beginning of your game has to be really gripping, right? You have to be able to grab people immediately. And I think we're seeing increasingly as well with the rise of like streaming and how quick it is to jump into games or to get them on Game Pass or similar services. Um, if you don't grab people in the first like 15 minutes, they are just going to bounce because there's like hundreds of games out there that are going to do a better job than that of getting their hooks into you and like making you really feel like you want to keep going. So in some ways, thinking about this process, even if you're not going to do a demo or a trial, might actually be really valuable because you could really think about, okay, how long does it take when we start the game from booting it up? How long does it take before they're having fun? How long does it take before they're invested in these characters? How long does it take before they're thinking about they want how long they want to play this like for, for weeks afterwards? And um, what do you make of that as like a concept? That's got to be important, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, demos aren't just a great sales tool. They're also a great marketing tool, no matter what kind of demo you have. You know, the, the purpose of it is uh, not only to allow customers to understand what your game is about to see if it's right for them but it is also your chance to just get them in get them to try and um i think the best demos always end in a way that makes people want to play more and that is easier for certain types of games than others so for example story games if you can have your demo cut off right before or like right, right after a cliffhanger or like a big story beat or something that's like oh okay I want to find out more I think that works really well it works on me because I'm very much a story driven gamer so if I play a demo and the demo's like oh here's a big revelation but to find out more you have to play more I'm like okay yeah I'm sold that's you know that's how it is yeah. um obviously that's not as easy for the game so something like a strategy game um, that's more, I guess, about just giving the players a very satisfying game loop. So that's more about uh, introducing the kind of key features, letting players uh, understand the mechanics, and then giving them a satisfying conclusion where they can be like, okay, I'm going to build this city. I've done the city. I've done what I needed to do. Great. I feel, I feel satisfied. And when they're on that dopamine rush is when you cut off and you're like, hey, if you want to do that more, come and play. So there's lots of different ways that you can structure it, but something, the end of the demo can sometimes be one of the most important things by showing players exactly why they would want to continue. Um, and the rest of the demo is almost like a way to get them to that point so that they can be like, oh, okay, this is, fun i like this i want to play more i want to try again yeah um yeah and we talked about or you hinted out there that this idea that if you have the resources maybe your game allows for it because it's maybe a more of an indie title it's not quite as massive and all-encompassing as a little bit easier to, to tweak and mess with you could make a dedicated demo which differs in some ways from the main game it could be completely unique or it could be a taster of what the whole game offers that's pulled from various parts of the game and combined in like a new way rather than just giving them the beginning sometimes games that have like a lot of progression based mechanics benefit from this right because they're like oh we want to, you to get a little taste of like how powerful you could be in the game once you've put more hours into it um how do you decide what to include when you think about that i guess it comes down to what's like the core part of your game's dna right it's about what makes it special Exactly. I think it's very much tied to, uh, yeah, the, the core of the game, the DNA of the game and the genre of the game. You know, just like with game genres, um, you know, customers are going to have specific ideas of what a strategy demo should be or what a story game uh, demo should be, etc. So it's really about trying to understand what makes your game exciting and also what makes it different. So sometimes when we talk about marketing, you know, the, the trick to marketing any product doesn't have to necessarily be a game, but it works for games as well, is figuring out both what 
is similar of your game to other games so that you can get people to understand like oh, okay this game is like this other game that i enjoyed it has these similarities that i know i will enjoy but also really finding that unique selling point and figuring out like okay well it's similar to these other games but it does this thing different and when you figure out that element when you figure out what you're trying to say with your game what you're trying to get people to feel because you know buying is a very emotional journey you know if you can get people to have that dopamine rush that excitement um it's much more likely they're going to be like okay i want to purchase this game and try to distill that and think okay well if i've only got 20 minutes to get someone's attention and to get them to understand exactly what my game is about what does that look like do i take the first 20 minutes do i cut out a bit from the middle um do i create something that's completely like uh, on its own and some games I've seen do that quite successfully uh, especially in indies you know some games will just create a whole prologue which you only play as a demo it doesn't appear in the full game but it gives people a bit of an understanding of the world or the um, the characters the issues that you're facing and I think that's really really powerful especially for story games where you can kind of get those little tidbits already in there and then end with a nice cliffhanger or a nice like oh, shocking revelation and get people to be like, okay, I have to play the rest of the game because I have to know what happens next. Yeah, you want the EastEnders moment with the where they go, du, 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 and then you're like, oh, now I've got Basically. to watch EastEnders again. But EastEnders <laughs> is a new video game. Um, you mentioned the marketing kind of potential. I guess demos are potentially really powerful, aren't they? Because they can convince people that they need your game, they want to buy your game. But they can also have the opposite effect. Like if you have a demo that's not very engaging, it can maybe eat into those sales because more people can it's try before you buy, right? It's good for consumers. But some of those consumers might have been potential sales that are then like, you know what, this is really not for me. Um, how do you kind of balance that? And how do you think that demos or the availability of demos affects your marketing? Is it better to send people to your demo rather than pre-order page or... Is it a mix of both? Like, how would you kind of approach that if there was a demo live? That's a really good question. So if there's, um, I think for me, it's a bit of a mindset shift in terms of demos because um, it's a mindset shift of, you know, what a sale means and what a long-term relationship with a customer means. And I think demos um, are one of those things that, you know, some people say it's the best thing ever and it made their game perform so much better. Some people say, actually, it made my, my sales go down. It's one of those things that's kind of hard to pin down. But in my experience, I don't think I've ever seen a game negatively suffer by having a demo if the demo was good, as in it was representative of the game. And I think the other mindset shift is about whether your game even needs a demo, because like with any marketing, and I think this is something that, uh, especially those kind of in the indie sphere, people who are just starting out, who might not you know, know much about the, the marketing sphere of things, but you know, marketing takes time, marketing takes skill, it takes money. It is something that's worth doing. And if you cannot take the time and the money and find the right people to make your demo as good as it can be, it's like, well, should you even have a demo? And it's the same as anything. You know, some people say like, you should just have a trailer, even if it's no matter what, you should just have a trailer. And it's like, well, yes, a trailer is a really powerful piece of marketing, but if your trailer is made in paint and your your voiceover over it and it's using weird clips like that's Take my not... money. <laughs> I want that game. Well, <laughs> there is a concept of anti-marketing, which is another fascinating topic where people do exactly that, is they make them least marketable things, but people love it. And it can work, but it's very hard to do. Yeah, sorry, I took you on a tangent there. Go back to what you were saying. <laughs> Um, and um, so, so really think of thinking about like, hey, if I've only got this much budget to make my game, can I spend 5% of that budget to make a demo to pull people in? Can I put in the time? Can I find the right people to help me make the demo to make it really worthwhile? Because, you know, 
you don't need a demo, right, to sell. Like, it's just another tool in your marketing arsenal that you can use. Uh, but it can, in my experience, it's very helpful if it's done properly, if it's done seriously. Um, and when I, you know, talk to clients in the past who are worried about people, you know, trying the demo um, and not liking the game, it's like, well, if they buy the game and they don't like it, most likely they'll return it if it's on a system they can return. Yeah. Right. So it's like it's, you're not losing anything, really. Or you get people who really hate the game, who have given you that little bit of money, but they're just like, oh, I'm never going to touch anything from that developer again or something, etc. So it's almost like part of your, uh, you know, customer retention strategy is just to be as flexible because not every game is for everyone. And I think the the best developers understand that and they're like, well, great. You know, I want my game to be in front of people who are going to love it, who are going to come back, who are going to purchase more games, who are going to get into, into the community, etc. And, you know, returns aren't really even that common as it is. You know, it can be a problem if someone gets, um, uh, not doxxed per se, but sometimes, you know, people do like silly things on Steam where if someone goes viral for something, they'll buy and return the game. But that's very, very rare. And I wouldn't say it's worth being worried about the demo having that impact as long as it's good. If you're proud of your demo and you're like, this shows my game and I think people are going to understand what I'm trying to do, then demo's going to do the work for you. And if people don't gel with it, they wouldn't have gelled with your game anyway. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, Sony's obviously making a big push for them to kind of come back in a major way on the PlayStation side of things. Do you think that demos and trials are maybe kind of on the way out? Because we've talked a lot on the show recently about, um, I guess, this trend in the industry towards subscription models, things like Game Pass, where a demo is almost irrelevant on Game Pass, right? If, you, if there's a demo on Game Pass, you'd be like, why would I, why would I even play that? I have the game. I, I technically own it for the price of my subscription. Um, yeah. So do you think that demos maybe are, you know, here right now, but not a long-term strategy? It's an interesting question. I think we'll have to see because I think maybe the idea of a free demo might be something that's a little bit kind of under risk because if games are super cheap or if they're really easy to access, then being able to try it for free isn't really you know, uh, an issue anymore. Uh, but I do think that the concept of a demo is not just about trying something for free, but just trying something in a short space of time. You know, there's, there's so many games out there. There's so much going on. Being able to provide consumers like a 10 minute snapshot of exactly what they're going to get before they sink time into it, I think can still be very powerful. It can still be a um, community engagement tool rather than a marketing tool per se that allows people to be like okay I get the point of this game in 10 minutes I know that I want to spend more time in it or the opposite of do you know what it's not for me I'm not going to go for it I guess with subscription services it's not so much about the sales because the contract with the provider has already been signed and I'm sure they have their own kind of KPIs they're trying to stick to but I do find it interesting I think that's something that I think Sony is trying to do a bit differently because obviously they're doing this um, demo trial thing with games that people are going to be accessing on a subscription anyway. So they're not going to be like free demos, right? Because you're already paying that subscription. Yeah, you, um, you're paying for the privilege of, play, of playing the trials, but you don't have full access to the games in the way that you would with, with a Game Pass, for example, I guess is how it's going to work. Ah, okay. That's that's my misunderstanding then. So, so I guess yeah. So it's a bit of a dual thing where it's you know trying to be mindful of people's money bottles at their time. I think demos are really great for that. Um, and you know demos in general, um, not just for when your game is out, but while you're making your game, while the game is being created, such a great tool to get feedback. Um, you know, there's a lot of emphasis in recent years, especially on Steam, for example, where Steam will have whole demo festivals twice a year where loads of games go on and they're like, hey, here's our demo. Some of those demos are 
um, just the first however many minutes of the game. Some of them are just the latest prototype and they're like, hey, just try our game, see if you like it, let us know what you think. Um, some of them are completely separate from the main game, so to give you a bit of a snippet. Um, so you can see definitely people are trialing lots of different things. And I think the, the popularity of these festivals shows that our, you know, demos aren't going away anytime soon. Um, but maybe we will see a bit of a change in terms of how people look at them. If, if every game has a demo, then it stops being so much a marketing tool because it just becomes the norm, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll see. Before we wrap up, I think we need to talk about what some of our favorite demos from game history. Because <laughs> uh, I know we both had to think about it before the show, just in case we it came up. Uh, what are some of your favorite demos? Gosh. Um, Do you want me to I go first thinking, to give you time to think yeah, of one? Yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I warned you this is going to happen. Um, I mean, when I think about demos that have like personally affected me, and I think I've told this story on the show before as well, or at least on Twitch before, um, but the demo for Halo 1, um, which is the third level of the game, Silent Cartographer, um, is... I mean, Halo's almost cheating, especially that first one, because almost any of those levels is like a good demo for the game in its entirety, because it's really self-evident of the kind of systems they got in play there with the weapons and the marines and the the interplay of the grenades and the guns and the melee. Um, but playing that was really kind of transformative for me. It really immediately understood what they were going for and that they'd nailed it. It was like, okay, this this is good. <laughs> Um, there's a few others that come to mind. I think the Stanley Parable is a great example of one that you were talking about, how indie games sometimes do kind of completely unique demos that aren't actually in the main game. That's what Stanley Parable does. So Stanley Parable, if you're not aware of it, is kind of like almost parodying the nature of like games and picking your own adventure as part of game narrative. Um, so their demo is very much a parody of game demos. <laughs> Um, and not really a real demo at all. Um, it's more of like a meta commentary on demos that you can play separately, um, which I think is really interesting. Um, in the chat, Miles is saying Dead Space 1, good demo. Yeah, so that's a great demo. And actually, similar but slightly different to that one, because Dead Space 1, I think, is about how good it feels. You know, the, the combat in Dead Space 1 feels really visceral and good. And when I think about visceralness, I always get remembered or get reminded of the Just Cause demo as well and how well they were like, they really understood the assignment of like, people just want to blow stuff up and like fly around. So here's just a little sandbox for doing that, just so you know what you're getting into with Just Cause, which I think is, is a, was a really smart move on their part. And the game, you know, did well largely in part because of that demo, I think. Uh, any examples you'd like to add, Ty? Looking through my Steam wish list because there's one particular one that I can't remember the name of. <laughs> I have so many. Um, one of my favourite in recent times is actually uh, an indie game called Backbone, uh, which is all about like this raccoon detective in like a, a Vancouver that isn't really a Vancouver, but it is. Because um, that that was another example of one where um, the prologue, as they called it, was uh, like a, a pre a preamble or actually no I think they had the first act of the game um, in the prologue and it was just super smooth gorgeous really showed off the game graphics and it ended with a oh crap this is happening this crazy stuff is going on and then you're like okay I want to play the rest of the game to really find out what's going on um, and you know many people agreed you know it was re a really popular demo um, it was, you know, the most talked about demo for quite a while in the indie space. People were really excited about the game. And actually, I haven't played the full game yet, um, but what I've heard... So it didn't, that... work. <laughs> so it didn't work. No, I have the game. I bought the game. I just haven't had the time to play it. Um, but what I've heard actually with that example, which is quite interesting, is that the demo was so good that people actually thought it was better than the rest of the game. Better than the game. Great. Uh, which is, I guess, the opposite of having a really bad demo and then, you know, not getting people to buy it is you also, you know, you have to not put all your eggs in one basket and make your, your demo, like, 
the best thing in the world, but your game doesn't actually match what the demo is showing. Um, again, I don't know if that's actually what they did because I haven't actually played the game myself. Um, that's just something that I heard. Uh, I'm nearly at the end of my Steam. There's one strategy game that I played in a de fe de uh, demo festival recently where you, you do really cool stuff and I just can't remember its name. And that's really annoying. I don't know if I'm going to find it. Uh, basically, it was a game, Terra Nil found it. There we go. Uh, so it's a strategy game and it's basically like a really relaxing strategy game where you start off with like a really broken world that's like full of pollution and like there's no greenery and slowly but surely you reintroduce basically uh, like um, the ecosystem to that map. And what I really liked about this is, first of all, it's a lovely game. It's just really chill. There's like no pressure. You're just making something nice. Um, with your time, which is really great. But what I really liked is that that demo was basically, as I was saying before, just a loop, a nice loop of gameplay where you start, you get introduced some new mechanics as you go, you complete the map, and at the end you feel really satisfied. You're like, look, I've just made this entire map green, I've introduced animals, there's rain all of a sudden, and then it stops and it's like, hey, we're going to be coming out in a couple of years, I think. They don't know, they don't know yet. Um, but yeah, and I think that's also just a really powerful way, especially if your game genre matches it, is just give people a 20 minute game loop. And if it's a good game, which is, I guess, a separate question. And if that game loop works, that's all you need to do sometimes, just show people exactly what they'll be doing. And at the end, they're like, ah, oh, that was nice. I like that. And then very excited about that game. Well, thanks so much for your time, Ty. Thanks for having me, Adam, and thanks everyone in the chat. Yep, thanks to those who've tuned in. If you're not already, make sure you follow us here on Twitch, and you can subscribe on YouTube as well. Uh, over on YouTube, we've got lots of videos, including the rest of that cyberpunk footage from today's show and yesterday's Star Wars stream, uh, which was special May the 4th edition. Uh, all that's on YouTube right now. You can go and catch that up and all sorts of other videos as well. We'll be back next week at the same time, 4pm BST. So uh, see you next week. Take care. Bye.